We will be looking at the book of Obadiah. Um, if you're not aware, Obadiah is a very small book in the Old Testament. Um, it's one of the prophets. There's the prophet. The prophetic books are broken up between the major prophets and the minor prophets. Um, the difference between them either being how long the prophet prophesied, the major prophets prophesied for a longer period of time, and how long the book is itself. Now that that necessarily that doesn't that isn't necessarily true though because the book of Daniel, for instance, only has like 12 chapters. And there's minor, there's a minor prophet that I think has 14 chapters. So the length isn't the main issue, but rather how long the prophet prophesied. Obadiah only has the one prophecy that we are aware of. So obviously he's one of the minor prophets. Um, we don't, well, I'll get to it. So let's look at the setting before we get too far ahead. Okay, so... You know, it, and God calls Israel out of Egypt, you know, saves them from slavery. They spend a couple hundred years having judges ruling over them, and then they transition to kings, um, as recorded in the books of First and Second Samuel. And uh, so Saul tries to start a, a monarchy, I guess you could say, that kind of fails. And then David is the next person. He actually succeeds. And, you know, it, can, it becomes more of, instead of just a couple tribes, it becomes a united Israel, um, and that lasts for all of David and his son Solomon, and then it kind of just falls apart into the north and the south. Now, the south um, is called Judah. It stays for a longer time before it's destroyed, and it, they always have one of David's um, descendants on the throne, and uh, it's something that's like kind of a big um, point for them, like a kinda like a pride point. And um, Jeremiah and, and Chronicles and stuff, they're, they're very, they very particularly mention about how the descendant, uh, David's descendant, is still alive in captivity, looking forward to, to hope that, that maybe they will be restored and that kind of stuff. So um, <clears throat> the northern half uh, of the Israel after, uh, Israel after they split is just called Israel or Samaria. Um, they fall in 721 to Assyria, and then the southern the southern kingdom, uh, which is just known as Judah, falls in 586 uh, to Babylon. At this point, Assyria has been uh, conquered by Babylon as well. So that's kind of the setting of, of what, what's, ha what's happening. Kind of dumbed down, I admit. I, it's not a whole lot. I didn't want to overwhelm you guys with details. Um, the book of Obadiah focuses mostly on a nation right next to Israel called Edom. Now, Edom was, an, like I said, it's a neighboring nation. They're just right next door. Um, and they had acted very, very dishonorable. They, they, had, um, they had done some very immoral things to Israel while they were uh, being conquered by Babylon. Now, Judah didn't conquer and didn't fall to Babylon all at once. They had basically three events. There was one in 590s, one in the 580s, another one was in, mm, I don't remember exactly, 6-something, six, six 604 maybe. So 604, 594, or something like that, and 586 was the final destruction. And uh, so with that happening, well, I guess I don't really want to get too ahead of myself here. But so while this is happening, Edom is kind of, you know... Just doing some jacked up stuff, and we'll, we'll we'll look at that more more in detail in the future. But so they're just kind of being turds, <laughs> like kind of. And Obadiah tries to show what's happening as more or less a sibling feud, and that's actually one of the big points that we'll we'll look at that. But um, <clears throat> so as far as the book of Obadiah itself, it was written after Judah's fall in 586. Likely before Persia defeated Babylon and allowed them to return in 531. So that's that's the windy window right there between 586 and 531. Somewhere between Judah being destroyed and Ju Judah being restored. Um, if you want to find more like details, uh, the book of Ezra would be when Judah is being restored, and the book of Second Kings would be more of Judah's down Judah's destruction to Babylon. Um, and those are both uh, in the Bible. So now to narrow it a little bit more, Edom, which is the nation that, that is addressed in the book of Obadiah, 
was destroyed in 553. And you can see that's almost right in the middle of the two dates. Um, the, the big question in Obadiah is, is he prophesying shortly before Edom is destroyed, in which case it's foretelling, telling the future, or is Obadiah prophesying shortly after Edom's destruction, um, which would be forthtelling, explaining why this is happening, what the good news is about such a terrible situation, that kind of stuff. So um, you're, we're going to look at this a little bit more as we go, but there's either interpretation is, is justified, either that Obadiah is prophesying about something that's about to happen or something that just did happen. Um, either way, we're looking at sometime around 553 um, being the date of the uh, prophecy itself. Um, Obadiah is the shortest book of the Old Testament. It's not the shortest book in the Bible. Um, the shortest book of the Bible, I believe, is 3rd John, followed by 2nd John, followed by Jude, followed by Obadiah. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's how it is. Um, but Obadiah is the shortest in the Old Testament by word count. Um, so the next the next question that people typically have about Obadiah is, is Obadiah a person? Um, and that's because the name Obadiah can actually be translated as servant of God. So is, is the person Obadiah a person, a personal person, or is it a just a... Uh, a vague person or persons who wrote it. Um, the 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 thing that makes it interesting, if it was a person or persons unknown, and it wasn't actually a person named Obadiah, is that it cites a lot of the other prophets. Um, for instance, there's this one part that's almost like word for word with Jeremiah. Um, it it obviously has Ezekiel as an influence, and um, there there's another one that it. Uh, is inspired by two, and I'll point it out when it's relevant. Um, so that would be the argument for it being not a a person Obadiah, but rather a serv the servants of God or a servant of God who who is like you know kind of like just bringing in some different things from different prophets to talk about Edom's destruction. I personally don't think that's a thing. Um, I think that Obadiah was an actual person. Uh, it was a very common personal name at this time, um, and so there's really no reason to doubt that it, it is an actual person. Um, and when you start the book of Obadiah, it kind of seems pretty obvious, but um, that's my take on it. Um, the next up is we know the only thing that we really know about Obadiah is that he was probably a lower class person. Um, the rich people had already been taken in exile. Um, you know, the, the, the rulers had already been taken. The, the only people left in Judah were like the lower class, like peasants. And so chances are, seems how Obadiah was in Judah, chances are that he was one of these lower class peasants, um, as that was all that was really left in the area. But any more than that, we have no clue. We know nothing about Obadiah. Um, the Jonah, for instance, is he's referenced in uh, in the Book of Kings, but Obadiah, y you don't really. I mean, he's not his prophecy isn't that long. Obviously, it's just short in the Old Testament, and it doesn't really give us any details about the person himself. Um, nobody ever quotes Obadiah in the rest of the Old Testament, but he quotes other big deal prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Um, so we really don't know anything about him. Now, as far as who was the prophecy given to? Well, the book of Obadiah is about Edom's destruction. And it's also about God's restoring Israel, yes. Um, but there's this, there's this problem that comes up with, with prophets. And that's what's called hypothetical verse real addressee. And what that means is that sometimes a word was for somebody that it didn't actually get to. For instance, Ezekiel, it says that he faced the direction and spoke to the, towards them, where their land was. So it wasn't really there. Um, but then also sometimes it says that they wrote it on a scroll and, and, and sent it to the people. So that's possible too. For instance, Jonah literally went 
to Nineveh. We don't really know if Obadiah like left Judah to go across the across the Jordan to Edom, or if he if Edom was even still a thing. Remember, this this prophecy might have been given after Edom was already destroyed. So, where does that leave us? Well, prophecy, the prophecy was either given to Edom or scattered Israel. Now, I already mentioned it's it was common for them not to actually go, and Edom might have been destroyed at this point. So, it seems like it could go either way. I personally uh, agree with Daniel Block, who says that it was given to to Judah to the to the scattered Israelites and not to Edom and we'll look at that more in the future but uh, the main point there that being that it would be a source of hope for Israel um, especially since if this if Obadiah was given after Edom was destroyed we can already know right then that it was given to Israel because Edom wouldn't have been there to have heard the message however and I think I have this written somewhere else so we might bump into it in the future if it was given before Edom was destroyed he wouldn't have really had to go very far because Edom had actually started encroaching on Judah's land after they had been destroyed the nation had been destroyed they were just scattered remnants of, of the Israelites so Mo um, the, the the Edomites sorry I don't know if I keep saying the Moabites but the Edomites uh, had actually gotten to move on over into Judah's territory so they probably would have heard the the prophecy anyways um, as far as prophets themselves the prophets didn't have political power in Israel they were not a, like a, a force to be reckoned with they were more like preachers um, they couldn't impose their will um, they said what they said was the word of the Lord and people could either listen or not listen just like with pastors nowadays it's not like the pastor can you know bend you over his knee and give you a good spanking or something like it just they didn't have that kind of power they they just simply gave the word of the lord and you either listened or you didn't listen um now this is kind of funny though because the the kings would use false prophets to validate their political decisions like they would decide what to do and then they get their pro their false prophets to kind of like play to their tune and it, I guess it was a way of getting people behind the action of the king. Um, but the prophets, once again, didn't really have much of a say-so in, in, in the world. Um, so Israel wasn't actually a nation at the point that Obadiah is given. Uh, he mentions instead the house of Jacob, and um, he mentions the house of... Uh, he mentions a couple different, and we'll, we'll get to that as we go through the book, so I didn't write down the other one. But um, he mentions a house of Jacob, and th the reason why is because, once again, the nation didn't really exist. There were, there were basically four areas where Israel existed in, or I guess you could say four, four groups. Okay, The first group was when the northern kingdom was conquered by Assyria. Now, what happened to the people who lived there? Assyria took them out, and they kind of just got scattered among the nations, and they kind of just became nothing. They're the they're called the ten lost tribes of Israel. You might have heard that that term. That's where that comes from. Um, the grand majority of the ten tribes was was just lost to, to history and time. Um, the second group. Um, so the fir the first group is just kind of lost to time. Um, and the funny thing about that is the the more it seems like the more small and insignificant tribes of Israel suddenly got a chance to flourish. The second group of where Israel was um, is like I already mentioned the group that Obadiah was a part of that existed in Israel, just you know peasants, you know impoverished, um, undesirables. They really had nothing going for them. The third group was, existed as a group of colonies in Egypt. Um, these Israelites became mostly irrelevant and were kind of lost to, to the main stage. Like, they were still there, but they weren't really a part of what was going on. If you read, for instance, in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, um, it talks about uh, the exiles returning back to the promised land. The, the, call Egypt, the Israelites that, that lived in Egypt were just kind of like over there doing their own thing. They, they don't really enter into the group that came back to Judah. And then the last group of the four was the exiles in Babylon. Now, Daniel was one of the exiles taken to Babylon, and if you read through the book of Daniel, you'll see, you know, the people there. If you read in Esther, it talk, talks about different groups of Israelites scattered around um, and whatnot. Um, 
So those are the four groups of where they existed. Obadiah is the one that lived in Judah with those peasants. So uh, the main point of the book of Obadiah, justice will prevail. Now this is a very encouraging uh, thing because of where the Israelites were at. And I'll, in just a couple slides, um, or points, I guess you could say, I'll, I'll talk to you about some of the things that the Israelites were believing at this time. Um, and the second main point of Obadiah is that Yahweh had not forgotten Israel. This was a big point because it was like, okay, Babylon has come and destroyed Israel. Where does that leave us? Because they were God's people, then they were destroyed by Babylon, so where does that put us now? Like, are we still God's people? Has he forgotten is what are we doing here so there was a kind of like a disconnect there and we'll look at some of the more theological claims that they had um the he obadiah was speaking to a group of people who were very cynical um and so it would have given them hope as far as the format of obadiah a lot of times if you look in your bible it'll almost always be formatted as poetry um, but it seems more like prose instead. Um, this might not seem like a big deal, but remember that you would interpret poetry a little bit different than you would prose. Poetry will be more of uh, maybe metaphors, and prose will be more literal. So, you know, that's something that's kind of, a lot of people argue about this back and forth. Um, there is a potential for poetry in it, but it doesn't really follow typical Hebrew uh, poetry, so it's kind of like, hmm. A lot of back and forth there. Don't know if you guys care about that. Thought I'd throw it in just in case you did. Um, so they, I Israel at this point had a lot of common thought. You know, uh, things that people, the Israelites generally believed at this time that weren't exactly on board. And we'll just highlight a few of them that will maybe help you understand where they're coming from. Some of this is recorded in Ezekiel. Some of it is referenced in some of the other prophets. Um, the first thing is, is they saw that Yahweh had abandoned them. This was a big thing for them because, you know, hey, we were holding on to the promises of God and God just abandoned us. He left us. And meanwhile, God was trying to warn them and they were living in sin and they wouldn't hear anything about that, you know, but then at the same time, they kept holding on to the promises without, you know, following through on what God had commanded them to do. There's this kind of disconnect between, you know, me serving God and God doing everything that I like all the time. So, I mean, very similar things. It, it's hard for us to understand, but the truth is is that modern-day Christians do the exact same thing. So, I mean, we should probably understand it even better. Um, the land which was given to them by God was no longer there. So it was just kind of, that was a little bit confusing there. So they still had the law. They didn't really follow it, but they still had it, but it was disconnected because most of everything with the law talked about Yahweh not leaving them and them living in the land. And then David no longer reigned anyways, so you had this – that was like their foundation. They had their ruler, the descendant of David. They had the land given by God. They had the law given by God. They had, See what I mean? And so now they have this fractured um, – fractured foundation for their beliefs and it left them all very disoriented um and then also the altar and temple had been destroyed by babylon in 586 from that last time that babylon came i mean they really they got kind of pissed off that they had to come for the third time so they just went ahead and finished the job i mean they they completely tore down the temple it's it's destroyed it's it's nothing um and so then that kind of leaves them with huh and then there's this another problem which i hope that one day we will look at this but um Shortly before Obadiah uh, prophesied, Ezekiel gave a prophecy about how the temple would be uh, would be rebuilt and it would be huge. And I mean, like the whole five last chapters of Ezekiel are just about this temple being restored, but it never was. That thing that Ezekiel prophesied never happened. So, uh, like I said, this, this caused a lot of confusion for Israel. It caused a lot of confusion for modern day Christians. It's just something that, you know, hey, was Ezekiel a false prophet? Just all kinds of these these things. It's just what's going on here. And we're not going to look at Ezekiel. We're looking at Obadiah. Just I want to point something, point it out is all. Um, and they believed that Yahweh was obligated to them, like he owed them. Because we're, we're your people, so you kind of owe it to us to, to work this out. Um, they clung to his promises without observing his warnings or obeying his laws. Just like Christians do now. Hey, I can live however I want, and then God just has to bless me for it. Um, then there was this idea, basically, if 
if another nation beat you, it wasn't just the nation itself that beat you. It was also their, their patron deity, the, the god that governed their city. So Babylon's patron deity was, was a god named Marduk, um, which sounds a lot like the bear from Brave. Marduk! If you guys have ever seen Brave, no? Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, so, so there was this kind of idea that maybe Yahweh had been beaten by Marduk, and, and so there was this kind of a little bit what's going on there. And so the people of Israel, by and large, had this kind of bitter and confused outlook on the world, bitter about what had happened. In fact, you see this in Psalm 137 where it says, how blessed it would be if somebody would come by and take their children and just throw them up against the rocks and kill them. It's like, okay, calm down. Wind it down a little bit, buddy. Well, now you understand where that bitterness is coming from. They're just very aggrieved, and, and, and they've seen tragedies. They've seen horrors. They're completely theolog their complete outlook on God has been completely shredded. And um, so they're very confused. They're at a place of being hopeless. They don't know where to turn. Um, and if you want a more uh, in-depth picture about you know how – People were feeling and looking at things. Definitely read Jeremiah, uh, which was, you know, up both up to the destruction about of of Judah and and shortly afterwards, Lamentations, which is some which is probably written from Jeremiah, who saw Judah being destroyed, and wrote the book of Lamentations. Um, and then Ezekiel gives a lot of a lot of uh, you know details about it and and whatnot. So just a few more things. One of the proverbs that they would quote was, the fathers have sinned and the children are suffering, or the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Um, and, and the idea here is that we didn't deserve this. It was our parents and grandparents who who, who, who did this, and we're just suffering for, for their disobedience. Uh, and that's why Ezekiel gave that prophecy where he quotes this proverb, and then he says, no, everyone will die for their own sin. And that's kind of the context of what he's talking about there. Uh, the, obviously, I already mentioned this, God has abandoned us or maybe was beaten by Marduk. Um, what we do doesn't really matter. It can, they got to this point of being uh, fatalistic, like um, they, it was doomed to happen, right? So, uh, you know, anything that they did wouldn't really matter. If they turned to God, God wouldn't hear them. If they if they, if they kept, kept on doing what, what they were doing and just living however the heck they wanted, it wouldn't matter. Like, it was just whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Um and that was kind of connected with this idea that maybe God either can't or won't do anything. Um, and that that was very much just so a, a belief after Judah fell. You know, oh, Judah's been destroyed. Nothing we do matters. It just it doesn't matter. I can, I can live however I want or whatever. I mean, God's not going to hear us. Either maybe he can't do anything about it or maybe he just won't. Maybe he just doesn't love us. I don't know, whatever. Um, but then before Judah was Judah fell, um, they had this idea that, hey, we are fated for this to happen. Judah will be destroyed no matter what we do. Um, and, you know, kind of nothing we can do would change anything of what happens anyway, so we might as well just go ahead and eat and dine for, you know, uh, tomorrow we die or whatever. Um, and then they also have this idea that, hey, God will save us and he'll remain faithful without us holding to our end of the deal. I mean, all throughout the law, and God said this, look, if you do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to bless you, and all this different stuff, but, but if you don't, then this is what's going to happen. You're going to be cursed, and you're, you're going to be kicked out of the land. Things are just not going to go well for you. Well, they conveniently forgot that part of the law, but then they they held on to the part where God said all the stuff that he would do. And it's like, well, it, you can't just live however you want and not have any consequences. Um, another thing that they did, they, they mixed their religions so they, you know, they, they weren't loyal to Yahweh in their worship. And then they picked and chose which parts of the, of the law they wanted to obey. But then, like, other things that they weren't crazy about, they just wouldn't do that part. I mean, how many times do you see Christians doing that, too? You know, I, I don't really like what the Bible says here. But I like what it says here. So then that takes us to um, Edom itself. Now, leading up to uh, Obadiah's prophecy, Edom was not just this this innocent bystander. Edom was actually descended from Jacob's um, from Jacob's uh, brother Esau, and so they were kind of they were they were related, you know, distantly, but yeah, they were they were related. And throughout the book of Obadiah, he constantly paints the picture. Of a brother betraying another brother, and that's kind of a kind of a big a big theme in the book of Obadiah. 
Um, and uh, maybe another way that I could say it is if one Christian um, got kind of fed up with another Christian, and so they kind of just left them out for the wolves. Maybe that would be another way of, of saying kind of what Obadiah is getting at. So what happened here? Okay, well, there was this anti-Babylonian alliance, right, where uh, a bunch of the different people in the Near East kind of got together, and they go to um, to Israel or Judah's king, and they say, hey, you should join our, our alliance so we can fight off Babylon. Uh, this is in about 594. But then Jeremiah prophesies and says, you know, this is not a great idea, guys. And... Uh, and so Edom's like, okay, good call, Jeremiah. And so they withdraw from the alliance. Well, you see what's about to happen there, don't you? They instigated something, and then they stepped out when it was convenient for them. <laughs> Which, I mean, I understand that they were that they were listening to the prophet. I, I get that. I get that. Um, but you can surely see how it looks like they've just got no spine. And so then, as a result, they got rewarded from Babylon. And that's why they got to move into Judah's territory, because they weren't part of that anti-Babylonian uh, alliance. <laughs> that they were technically a part of before, but they stepped out. So, okay, all right, all right, just so we understand what's going on. Um, so they benefited from Judah's fall, and they're just, like, super excited about it. Um, they actually did a lot of things like um, turning over refugees and stuff like that. We'll, we'll look at that as we look through Obadiah, but they did a lot of corrupt things that were just kind of jacked up. And uh, kind of a betrayal of a brother. Um, they also didn't hold up to their end of the bargain on alliances that they had made. Um, and, but we'll look at that when we go through Obadiah. And so then it ended with, um, you know, obviously they were never really loyal to anyone but themselves. So that ended exactly how you would imagine it ended. Babylon eventually destroyed them in five, about 553. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, you probably saw that one coming. If you've read any kind of, you know, fiction in the world, you would see that one coming. It's like, oh, they're getting ready to kill off this character. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> um, so if Obadiah prophesied before 553, Edom would have been in Judah's old territory, so they would have been right there and able to hear. As far as the structure of Obadiah, you would think, was well, such a short book, surely it doesn't really even have a structure. But you would be wrong. It actually does have a structure. There is an introduction that's very brief. It's one verse. Super short, super to the point. But then we have a little bit of a reversal of roles here. Typically, you bring evidence to somebody, and then they're judged, right? Well, in the book of Obadiah, that's completely reversed. First off, Obadiah tells Edom their judgment. And then, after he's gotten through with their judgment, then he brings up their charges. Kind of in a reverse order. It's almost like he was really anxious to get out of the, you know, the, now let's get to the point here. You know, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> and uh, th there may have been reasons for that. We'll maybe look at that later. I might just drop it. I don't know. Um, and so then after he brings up, you know, okay, so in a brief introduction, tells them the judgment tells them their charges for the judgment, then he goes to the bad good news, and I'll explain that when we get there. And then after the bad good news, he gives good good news. So uh, that that's pretty much pretty much all that we're going to have to look at with the introduction uh, to Obadiah. Starting next week, we'll start going verse by verse through Obadiah, and I know that's super duper long, like 21 verses. Oh no, we'll be in Obadiah forever. Not like when we went through Proverbs, where it was like months of <laughs> verse to verse, and because Proverbs often repeats itself, we had to look at some Proverbs multiple times. So this, I don't think, will be on that same grand scale. Uh, any questions before we close this out? Everybody good? Awesome.